Mission Sunday. Now what that is is that our denomination asks us to pick a Sunday in the spring that's called Great Commission Sunday. It is to help kind of beef up a little bit our missions, global missions endeavors. It's a day that we set apart to recall our global mission to lead people to Christ, enabling them to become fully committed to His purposes. It's a day to come together as the United States Alliance people and family to extend the light of Christ, Jesus, further into the darkened areas of our communities and the world. Ephesians, where we are right now in our studies, is a reminder to the church that our greatest witness is walking in the light of Christ ourselves. Ephesians 5.8, which has been our theme verse, says, For you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. In your bulletin today, you receive this uh, little insert. And what normally happens on the, on the uh, Great Commission Sunday is that the congregations of the Alliance are asked to give a special offering toward the Great Commission Fund. This is different than your normal faith promise that you have made in the fall. This is a special offering. This offering is then put together, given to your pastor, not to spend, but to escort to general counsel, and then I put it in the offering at council, and then they tabulate all the offering that's come in from Alliance Churches, and they report... Um, what the the number is back to Alliance Churches in the United States. And so we're asking you to fill this out, and if you can give a donation to the Great Commission Fund on Great Commission Sunday, uh, our treasurer and our great people that deal with the finances will make sure that I get that check that I can deliver at council in just a few weeks down in Florida. So today is designated as Great Commission Sunday. Normally, on a day that it's missions, you would hear maybe from a missionary, or you would hear about mission work, so to speak. That's the traditional method of talking about Great Commission Sunday or talking about our missions conference, and we will be doing that again this fall during our missions conference. But today, as we talk about what it is to be the light of Jesus Christ, And if you have accepted Christ as your personal Savior, repented of your sins, and received Him unto yourself, you are the light of Christ to a world that is walking and filled with darkness. So what does it mean then, as a great commission, that each person, not just missionaries, but each person has been called to, what does it take, what does it look like to be someone who's walking in light? That's what we're going to look at today. To be a missionary is to have an effective service. An effective service requires, first of all, the character of Christ. If you want to turn with me in your Bibles, we're looking at the book of Ephesians. We're going to start with chapter 4, verse 17. That's where we left off. By the way, um, last week in our absence, the Gideon International was speaking here. And you, the offering that you gave toward getting internationals was over $600. And we praise God for your generosity. And there's a letter of thanks on the bulletin board by the coffee pots in the entryway. That, by the way, is a part of the Great Commission. Is to get the light of the world in the hands of each person living in darkness. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says this to believers. And he's writing... To specifically to the church, us, of Jesus Christ. So I say this and affirm together with the Lord that you no longer walk, just, you walk no longer as the Gentiles also walk. The people who were living in darkness, the people who were living in sin, in the futility of their mind. If you are a follower of Christ, you no longer walk that way. I no longer walk that way. Those people who were darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. It wasn't just that they didn't know, it's that they didn't want to know. 
And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to the sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity and greediness. But you did not learn Christ that way. Indeed, if you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth, each one of you, with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry. Anger is an emotion. And yet, do not sin in that anger. Don't let the sun go down upon your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer. But rather he must labor, work, performing with his own hands what is good, so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, so that it will be give grace to those who hear it. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. There's more we're going to look at in that passage, but let's start with the effective service requires the character of Christ. What Paul is talking about to the church, to us, is that we are not to look like us. Rather, we're to look like Christ. We are lights of the world, to the world, because of Christ who is in us. I think it was Spurgeon, I'm not sure, but he made a quote, and it's, and it's going to be paraphrased by yours truly. But he said that if, if you want to glorify Christ, then live in Christ. If you want to have people understand what hell is like, then just live like yourself. Something along those lines. You see, we can walk, and it's very easy to slide back into the old nature, the old self. When, the people, when people in politics, when people in general public, when people who are opposed to the word of God rise up against God and his people, it's because they don't see the light, they only see the darkness. Paul says they are to be pitied, not railed against. Effective service requires the character of Christ. What people who are living in darkness need to see is hope, the light of Christ, demonstrated to them even if they attack the very one that is de demonstrating the light. The character of Christ is developed in us by the renewing of our minds. In verses 17 through 23, I just read for you, those kinds of elements that the old manner of life is laid aside, the old self is laid aside, the idea of what I want out of life is laid aside. Rather, there should be a new self. In verse 23, but you will be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you and I will think differently about life, and we will approach it differently. We will not approach life as this is how I want to live my life, God come and bless it, but rather, God, how do you want me to live my life and I will be blessed as I follow it? There's a huge difference. Even as a young pastor, I remember hearing preachers at district conferences and something talking about surrendering your life to Christ completely and un just everything would be Him first, Him first, Him first. And I would think, and that sounds real holy, I mean, in a, in a, in a right way. But, and, and I'm trying to now identify to how we all think. But you know what? I've got hopes and dreams. I, 
I, I, I'm hoping that they're the same dreams God has for me. And so, and so, you know, I've got friends that if I live completely for God, I may shut them off. I've got, you know, I, I'm saving for this particular boat or this particular washer and dryer or this particular house. And, God, this sounds really good. And, yeah, if I surrender to you, you may say I could use those funds somewhere else. That's the reality of what we struggle with. And I struggled with it. You struggle with it. And then here we read by the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he says, lay aside all that. You be 100% fully devoted to serving God in your character. That the things that come out of your mind are the things that glorify God. The things that you devote yourself to are the things that glorify God. That when people see you, they don't see you trying to be good. They see Christ emanating out of you, flowing through you, because you have surrendered completely to the lordship of him. They see a new life. They don't see a Kevin trying to be something he's not, but they see a new Kevin who has been glorified through the power of Christ and his re redemption. That takes a daily effort, by the way. Why did the Apostle Paul speak here about anger, the issue of anger? Now, notice he made a def definitive change here. He said, you can be angry. Anger is an emotion. I'm so glad that he put that in there. Because when, you know, I'm trying to work, and if you know my craft, I don't have one. But if you, I try, if I'm working on the car, or I'm trying to build something in the house, my wife can tell you that I get angry. I get angry at tools for not working the way they're supposed to. Uh, I get angry at wood for being cut wrong. I get angry at cars that you get all done and realize you have parts left over. I get angry. So do you. Anger is an emotion, like love is an emotion, like, like other things in our, in our emotional being. But what Paul says here to the Christian is, you, you have an anger part to you. Jesus did too. But, he says, don't let anger overwhelm you. Don't let bitterness begin to build up inside of you because the anger is not dealt with properly. We should never even allow the sun to go down before we have dealt with the anger issue. Because it is a poison, it is a toxin. And the very next thing he says what is, don't give the devil an opportunity. Because if we're filled with anger, we are not filled with the Holy Spirit. Anger is an enemy to Christians. And if we have anger issues, then we have not yet surrendered them to God. Paul says we need to do that. We need to surrender that. Now, I'd love to say, well, you just come up here now this morning. Come pray. I'll pray for you. Your anger's gone. Uh, we know it doesn't work that way. It's gone until you stub your toe or something, and all of a sudden it comes back again. It is, it is working and walking in Christ that he will, he will tear away those things and gradually change us to be like Christ rather than to be like the old self. The problem is in our life, under the area of character, we get saved from our sins and we're, oh, we're redeemed. It's wonderful. But if we don't continue to take up the cross daily, we begin to slide back to our old nature. Now, we try to, we try to cover it with the goodness of God, but God doesn't want us to cover it. He wants to purify us from the inside out. We'll talk about how that happens in a little bit. The second thing for effective service requires the conduct of Christ. The renewing of our actions. Part of that is the anger thing I just talked about. It says, it says in the scriptures in verse 26 and following, it says, let's pick it up at 28, if you have stolen, if you steal, steal no longer. But he must labor, he must work 
performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Not only are we told not just to sit and let people give us or not to go and take things that don't belong to us, but he says we should be working for our, our goods. And one of the reasons is so that we can take what we've earned and give it to those who are in need. It's a, it's a different mindset than the world, by the way. The world says, get what you can out of this. I don't know if you've, you, you've uh, heard about this or not. I'm going to share something that's just new. Um, most people my age don't buy clothing from this company anyway because it's more of a youth company, but Acro... Ac I can't even say it. Acrocombie and Fitch. Yeah, okay. They came out, the, the, the leader, the LEO, CEO, whatever his, his title is, came out this week... Uh, with, with two incredible quotes. Number one, he said, our company, we would rather burn our clothes than give them to the poor because they aren't cool enough to wear our clothing. True. That's what he said. The second one was, um, <laughs> how can I say this? Uh, how do you put it? Fat people shouldn't wear our clothing because they're not cool enough. And so any woman that's a size 10 or, or above a size 10 shouldn't shop here because we're not making clothes for that size anymore. Now what is wrong with this picture? A person who says poor people and people dealing with weight issues shouldn't shop with us because we only want to specialize in certain clientele? That's the thought of the world. That's the way the world thinks. We have a special image of what that should look like, and you don't look like us, so you don't belong. That is the reason, by the way, why Christians are assaulted in the world today, in our environment, and in, in our Western culture. <laughs> What used to be the dark continent in Africa is now the light continent, and the dark continent is the United States, or is North America. Because we have, we're pushing back on God and saying, God, we have an image of how we want to live, and you're not, you're not there. Because you're calling us to a life of sacrifice, and I want stuff. You're calling us to be different than the world, and I don't want to look different. Effective service requires the conduct of Christ the renewing of our actions. Look what it says in uh, the last part of Ephesians 4 and into Ephesians uh, 5. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. In other words, be different. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other as God in Christ also forgave you. Therefore, verse, chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God. Look like God. As beloved children, walk in his love as Christ also loved you. And what did he do for us? Well, he gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. There is the difference. There's the light part for all believers. Where the world says, get what you can out of this, God says, give what you can out of this. Christ gave his life for us, and it says, be imitators of God. So we're supposed to give our lives for others. That is a tilt in the world. That is a tilt. Unless you're running for office and you want to look good, then you give some money so people say, hey, he was a giver. Selfish motivation. Immorality, verse 3, of any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. There must be no filthiness Silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather the giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Effective service requires the conviction of Christ. We will not live that way. So there's a renewing of your priorities. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons 
of disobedience. I don't want to hear that because I am naturally one who rebels against God. So are you. That's the sin nature. And here Paul says, don't be deceived. Don't let people begin to allow you or don't you start to justify your sins or the way you do things. Because it says here, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. So effective service requires the conviction of Christ by the renewing of our priorities. I'm going to be like Christ, I'm not going to be like me. I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to give, rather than expect people to give to me and get what I want out of life. I'm going to be like Christ in every way. And in every way means that my language will build people up, not tear people down. That when I am involved in an environment of co-workers or friends or neighbors or family members, and all of a sudden they start talking about things that are not honoring to God, I will rise up and leave, or I'll say I cannot be a part of this. Knowing full well, by the way, you're probably going to get persecution, a, a form of it. Look what it says further on in chapter 5. It says, don't be partakers with them, those who are disobedient, for you were formerly darkness. Ha, huh, we heard this before? But now you are light in the Lord. Walk then as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists of all goodness and righteousness and truth trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Do not participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. And for this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, Arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Folks, put it in practical, in, in a practical frame of reference. Try to put it in your life. Evaluate your life. You go to work, whether you're a boss or an employee, whatever it is, you go to work. And all of a sudden you hear this scripture that says, whatever you do, do for God. Okay, what does that mean? It means I don't like my hours. I don't like what I have to do today. But I'm doing it for Christ so that I will be a light of Christ to who I'm serving. So our goal as an employee is I will be the best worker in that environment that there could possibly be. That when people are in my job are complaining about hours or complaining about, about break times or complaining about pay scale or whatever they serve at the diner or whatever it is, I don't know. But when they're standing there complaining, and that's natural for the human man and woman to do that. I don't know why, but it's a part of the sin issue. While they're complaining about that, I'm going to enter in as the light of Christ and say things like, I am so glad God has allowed me to have this job. Not, I am so glad God has allowed me to have this job, and I am praying so hard that God will get back at that supervisor. We are to build people up, even if we don't agree with them. Or if they're around and they're telling these stories, there are, or maybe a, a couple of men, I've, I've seen this happen. <laughs> yeah, I've been involved, and so have you, where you're with your, your gender groups, and you're railing about your husband, or you're railing about your wife, or your kids, or whatever, and you're doing that, ah, oh, I can't believe she did this. Well, I can't believe he said that. And rah, 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 rah. Are we building up the body of Christ? I, yeah, that's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer it. I think you know. No, we're not. If we want to be the light of Christ in those environments, we must not surrender and fall prey to the enemy's de desire to lower and dim the light. Because there may be someone in that conversation, that environment, that's going through a very hard time. And they see a man or a woman that respects their spouse, even if they don't always get along and agree with what decisions are being made. They respect each other and they talk things through and they honor each other when they talk about each other 
in private. That's the light of Christ. Or people begin to tell, tell what we call shady jokes. And here the scripture says in Ephesians that we should not even think about those things. It's disgraceful even to speak of those things in conversation. Because when we do, we have made ourselves susceptible to the enemy to douse the light. And the people around us don't see Christ. They see darkness. We are the light of the world. Christ in us. Therefore, our conduct, our character, our convictions need to be that of Christ all the time. The words that come out of our mouth, the word choices that come out of our mouth, the things we laugh at, even the things that we expose ourselves to in the privacy of our homes. I'll give you an example. I don't know if any of you watch late night TV. I don't watch it that much because I'm going to go to bed before it's ever on. But late night TV, they, uh, and I won't name the, the talk, talking people because they all do the, pretty much this stuff, but at some point they, they use humor to downgrade our elected officials or to talk about things of sexuality in a humorous format. And if we relax our spirituality and our rela relationship with Christ, you and I both know that you can get caught chuckling at what they're saying. Right? I'm not, I'm not telling you anything you don't know. We have that moment in life, we have surrendered our holy life to Satan's temptation to degrade and to douse the light of Christ in our life. People who live in light, it's exposed. People who live in darkness, hide it. God calls us for effective service to fulfill the Great Commission to have the character of Christ, the conduct of Christ, and the conviction of Christ by the renewing of our priorities, the renewing of our understanding. In 8 through 14, it says, understand this, that we are, that we are to see these things. Anything that we put above God is an idol. He says we shouldn't be involved in idolatry. So if it's like, well, I kind of like that watching that show. I kind of like that. I know it's got garbage in there that might affect and people might not understand why I watch it, but I like it. Then it becomes an idol, doesn't it? Because we lift it above what Christ calls us to be about. I like money. Don't we all? <laughs> I got to tell you, I'll be very honest with you. Yeah, uh, yesterday, I'm reading on the website someplace, nobody won the Powerball, and I'm going, hmm, I wonder if it's time to buy a ticket. I don't buy those things. I don't gamble with that, my money, okay? But the, the, the lure of, you could be a millionaire like 500 times over if you win this thing. It's the enemy saying, come on, take a chance. Lower your standards just a little bit. That's how the enemy works. I must renew my understanding and I must renew my testimony. Verse 17, 15 through 17. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men or unwise women, but as wise ones, making the most of your time and because the days are evil, there's not much time left. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What is the will of the Lord? That all men and women would come to faith in Christ. And he has an army that he wants to be a light to the world, a vision of hope of what can be. To demonstrate the love of Christ. You know, my... Life verse, if you want to call it that, is found in Colossians 4, beginning with verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer. Keep an alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Praying at the same time. 
for us as well, meaning ministers and missionaries, that God will open up a door as to, uh, for the word so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ. Pray that we will have opportunity to share Christ, for which Paul says, I am now in prison, and that I make it clear in the way that I ought to speak. Verse 5, conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. And let your speech always be grace, with grace, as though seasoned with salt, so that you will know how you should respond to each person. Folks, I understand, it's a very, I understand that as Americans we have the right and the responsibility to enter into the political system so that we don't lose some of the rights that have been, that God has established for us at our beginning. Okay, I understand that. But we have to be so careful that we don't get so politically moved toward the goodness that we're losing, that we lose the goodness of Christ in the process of how we're doing it. You understand what I'm saying? A person needs to know that I stand for truth, but I do it with love. That I'm not going to get out there and whack their kids with a picket sign or something because, ah, you guys are so evil. Yes, they're evil. Darkness reigns in the world. They are acting out that which they know. They are not in the light. They are in the darkness. So to rail against the darkness means that I need to rail against Satan's kingdom, not the people who he has put in darkness. I'm not saying we don't get politically involved. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that when we do, we still have to do it with the grace so people will hear what we have to say by the grace of God. And not that we resort to their tactics or the world or the darkness tactics of trying to get our point across. Let them see Christ in us at every moment and every turn. That they know that we stand for what we believe in because it's truth, because it brings us hope, because it's glory. Not because we're conservatives and they're not. How does the message speak to the Great Commission Sunday? Because the scripture tells us in Matthew, go therefore and make disciples of Christ. A disciple is one who demonstrates in character and in conduct and in conviction the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. We are called to make the most of our time that God has given us. Not for ourselves, but for Christ and for the sake of others. The world being consumed by the darkness of sin. It is all around. Jesus is the light of the world. Those of us who are followers of Christ are children of light. Therefore, we must walk, live as children of light. I was joking with the worship team today. and Actually, I asked Greg if he would close in prayer once we're, we're completed this morning and he says oh that's so you can get out to your car quick and get out of here because I told him I said oh this might be a little touchy at the end I'm, you know might be one of those things where I'm stepping on people's toes but I'm doing it for the right reason so I hope you have steel toed shoes on today the scripture calls for us the application of how we can have the character the conduct and conviction of Christ is that we invest our time to mature in Christ. Time, time is more of a commodity in this world of ours than money. My wife and I are talking all the, all the time about time and the fact that we don't have much of it. And so do you. It's like, oh, tomorrow I, got, I get to do this. No, I got this and this and this and this. We're not talking about how much time we have, because everybody has the same amount of time. We're talking about what to eliminate so we have more time, and so are you. But number one, if we're going to think like children of light, is all of my time belongs to God. Therefore, I must take time to invest in growing in Christ every day. It starts with investing time with God. Here we go. I'm going to talk to the men. I'm not picking out any one person because I've had this conversation with many from different churches that I've served. 
I have men come to me and say, I wish everything was on DVD because I don't read. And yet, if they are a hunter, they're reading sports magazines, talking about guns and bows, reading up on the newest trend, how to get out in the woods and stalk your prey. If they're fishermen, they're reading about the newest rod and reel or the boat that's out there or the new life jacket they just invented or what. Am I stepping on toes yet? <laughs> if you like cars, you're reading about you know, how to remodel cars or how to refurbish cars or, or what, what, how do you fix this piece here. It is not that you cannot read. It's that you do not want to read. I can't speak for the ladies because I'm not a lady. But I suspect that there are lady excuses out there for why you can't do those things too. Time, children, I don't know. What we read about today is if we want to be effective in fulfilling the Great Commission, it requires the character of Christ, who, by the way, worship God alone every day, the conduct of Christ, and then he modeled it for his disciples, and the conviction of Christ, if this is truly what Christ wants of me, then I will do it. It's time to invest our time, not what we have left, but Christ first, to grow in our faith. Secondly, invest our efforts to share Christ with others. And I know that not everybody can speak fluently about their knowledge of the Scriptures. But everybody can speak about what has happened in their personal life. And we do, don't we? You know, you go to a movie, and, hey, you see that movie? And blah, 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 blah. We talk about the experience of that movie, trying not to ruin it for friends. At the same time, I've got, I know people, my, I have a brother, actually, that, likes to do that, tell you the end before you get there. It's like, thank you very much. But I don't get mad and let the sun go down. Ha! <laughs> or, or something happens with the grandkids, you know, and you're on Facebook and you're showing everybody these Facebook pages, you know, and you're talking to everybody. And, and uh, I got a Facebook page, and, and uh, I realize that some people, that's where they spend all their time, it seems. But the reality is that that... We must invest our efforts to share Christ with others. That means we put the thought of others above our own. Not saying that we don't think about ourselves or our own families. But folks, this is the part that Christ wants us to understand. If people are living in the darkness of sin and they're separated from God, they are bound to hell forever. And you and I might be the one light that God has brought into their life to help them know what redemption's all about. We're also supposed to invest our finances to spread Christ to the world. We read that in this passage, that we're not to be lazy. We're supposed to work with the labor of our efforts. We're supposed to get paid. And the reason we have finances is to help others. And I'll tell you, if, if anything, that is not what the world sees finances for. I know that this lesson, it is a toe stomper because it stomps on my toes. As I'm reading this, I'm thinking about evaluating my life and my prayer time and my quiet time. And I know those days where, where, where one day it's like, oh, I, 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 I'm in a rush. I, I know I, I, should be, I should pray for a little bit here or I should read my Bible a little bit here. And, but I, I kind of woke up late. I'll do it tomorrow. And then tomorrow comes, it's like, oh, oh, I know I should, it, I'll, I'll do it the next day. And then all of a sudden the habit is I'm not doing it. Even though I know I should be. Even I know that times with God is what brings the brilliance of the light out and burns the flame, the brightest. And you know what I'm talking about because you go through the same struggles. So today is to remind us that if we are truly going to be the light of Christ, if we're truly going to walk as the light before people, we need to invest ourselves in the time with God and growing in our faith and 
and sharing with others our resources so that the, that the Great Commission can be fulfilled locally as well as globally for God's glory. Jesus Christ is the hope of the nation. I'm going to ask our worship team to come forward. He really is the hope of the nation. And, and, and I know there's a better way he could have did it. But because he loves us so much, he says, I want to incorporate you and me, those who are already followers of Christ, to be the witness of Christ to the world. When I say there's a better way, he knows there's a better way, not I know better than God. Please don't misunderstand what I meant. I just, it's like we're such frail and, and we make mistakes. God says, yeah, but I have, I have confidence in you and I'm using you. You are the mouthpiece. You are the hands, the feet, the eyes. You are God's light to a dark world that's living in pain and suffering. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So walk as children of light. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. You are truly an awesome God who has great patience with us. Lord, we could walk out of here filled with guilt. Lord, you don't want us to walk in guilt. You want us to walk in the joy and the freedom of your light. You want us to draw ourselves closer to you by surrendering our time to you, our money to you, our children to you, our lives to you, our jobs to you, our homes to you. We, you want us, God, to let you be first place in our life. And I pray that we recommit that this morning. And that, Father, we will be a light in a dark world. The light of Christ as you shine through us. And that we will be your spokesperson. We will be kindness in a world that's filled with hatred. We will be goodness in a world that's filled with evil. Because of Christ in us. Thank you, Jesus. I pray in your name.